Hey everybody, today's species spotlight is a pretty obvious one. And honestly, I've been kind of putting this one off for a little while just because of the community around this particular type of snake. So let's get right into it. Obviously today we're talking about carpet pythons. With me today is Hachi. She is a juvenile jungle carpet python who we are still working on handling. She came with us in a big acquisition and we are very slowly working on trust training. And so with that, I have this large stick that will allow her to feel secure while I'm not actually holding on to her while getting used to being out and about with the noises and cameras and me talking and everything like that. Can you look that way, please? So carpet pythons, Morelia spilota, an amazing species of snake. They normally come from parts of Australia and parts of New Guinea and Indonesia. Now, part of Australia is essentially they occupy the north, east, and southern parts all around the whole kind of north cupping around the eastern side of the continent and then the southwest portion and then a little bit inland of those coastlines and then a little bit into Indonesia and New Guinea. Now these guys get their name carpet python because supposedly they are named after the oriental or some of like the asian inspired cultural rugs that are those like oriental rugs that have that really nice ornate and beautiful intricate pattern now with that being said carpet pythons are one of the most iconic species of snake in the hobby today and they have a lot of very amazing features that make them very very distinguished amongst a lot of other reptiles among them being their very prominent labial pits, as well as their large triangular heads. Now, there are uh, an arguable amount of different subspecies of carpet pythons. Right now, it is generally agreed upon there are roughly six different subspecies. The jungles, like Hachi right here, the coastals, the inlands, the darwins, the diamonds, and the southwesterns. I think I nailed them all right there. Inland, coastal, jungle, Southwestern, Darwin, I'm forgetting one. Diamonds, yeah, we got them all, we got all six. Now, all of them are fairly similar. They all average about six and a half-ish feet in length. Some are longer than others. The coastals actually seem to average the longest with individuals very frequently hitting eight to nine feet. And one individual which was recorded accurately was kept in Europe was actually 396 centimeters. And for anyone who's watching who's not in the rest of the well, not in the rest of the world and in the United States, that's just under 13 feet long. So a very long snake. Now with that being said, these guys are really, really, really cool. They all occupy very different climates, but they're all pretty hardy snakes, and the care for them is very similar. So for, but they all occupy different habitats. So for instance, the coastals and the jungles here occupy more of like the rainforest type areas. And they're a little bit more plainsy and roamsy. And these guys, the inlands, the coastals, and the jungles are a lot of times the ones that you see on a lot of those like YouTube videos of these guys eating like the big wallabies and possums and stuff. And then the southwesterns, which seem to be the population that is the most isolated, is separate all the way over on the other side of the continent, the southwestern portion, are some of the ones that we have the least amount of working with. Not only that, but they also occupy a more arid, dry climate, especially compared to the rest of them. And then the other, the last of them, the diamond pythons, which actually are the namesake of taxonomy, it's Morelia spilota spilota, have a really weird range where they're the furthest southwest um, and part of their range actually gets snow parts of the year. So they're actually considered sometimes more of the cooler weather climates reptiles. Where are you going, silly one? Now, with that being said, these guys have cemented themselves in the hobby, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And there is almost, it's a very interesting part of the hobby to be completely honest with you so we all know that with a lot of colubrids a lot of it has to do with locality and with ball pythons it's obviously nothing but the morphs where are you going silly where are you going but with these carpet pipe with carpet pythons there is a very weird and very close-knit community and honestly there's kind of a little bit of infighting that goes on a lot in there that has to do with locality and morph 
and line grid animals. A big part of that comes with the fact that we don't have full access to a large population of these guys because being an Australian species, we don't have a large amount of them to work with. And so because of that, there's a lot of debate when it comes to actually pure locality animals. In fact, a 100% jungle carpet python is a very highly sought after animal, but there's a lot of real debate that goes to say that there may not actually be any 100% pure jungle carpet pythons here in the United States. And I know me saying that is part of the reason why I've been putting off making this video for so long, because people get very, very upset about kind of questioning the norm and the established things that we know about these animals. Another thing is that a number of years ago, they actually discovered that the Darwin's carpet python, the originator of the albino gene in carpet pythons, as far as we know, is actually genetically identical to the Papuan carpet pythons or the Irian giant formerly carpet pythons. So that in and of itself was a huge upset in the Morelia community, which is essentially why a lot of people that I am just a little bit into were often refer to each other and the community themselves as chondro snobs. Chondro being kind of the old colloquial term used for a lot of the Morelia, including carpets as well as the green tree pythons. Where we get very, and I say we because I'm somewhat included in this, but overall the chondro or Morelia community is very, very intricate and very close-knit, despite the fact being very widespread about line-bred animals, about true, pure locality genetics, as well as all of the different morphs. So, for instance, you know, we talked about the albino jungle. They're, not the albino jungle, <laughs> the albino Darwin's carpet python. There's also tigers and azanthics and all these other really cool ones that come from the different localities. Now, we're going to take all of that fun, like, community drama, and we're just going to put it to the side and talk about how cool these pythons are. So, as I said before, these guys are a very hardy, widely distributed species of snake, and all of the different subspecies all can be kept very similarly for the most part, and all of that translates into us keeping them in captivity. So in Australia, a good portion of them come from either plains or tropical areas, at least for a good majority, good portion of the year. And they are all semi-arboreal. We've all seen the pictures of these guys snagging parrots and bats and wallabies. These guys will kind of eat whatever they want. Um, and to be completely honest with you, um, sometimes these guys are known for eating those very large meals. Almost larger and comparable to body size, weight, and mass than like the Burmese pythons or the African rock pythons eating those very large like antelope and things. And so because of that, they're very generalistic once established. For the most part, these guys are absolute trash cans. We have another carpet python here outside of Morelia Bredlii, so our Bredels carpets, because they aren't actually the carpet pythons, they're not part of Spilota. Um, these guys... I, we have her as well, but she's in shed and she doesn't want to come out right now. And I'm not going to make her come out if she doesn't really have to, especially when they're in shed. But we are working with her. That's why she's out right now. And she's actually doing very, very well. Good girl, Hachi. Um, they can be kept semi-arborally. They need plenty of space. A lot of people will keep them in rack systems or small ones when they're tiny little neonates. These guys have a reputation for being very nippy, very striking, and very reactive, especially as little babies. But once you frequent handling, work on this trust building. As you can see, I'm sitting here doing this. She's not even like super keying in on it, like say a green tree python or a very anxious snake would be doing so. They usually establish themselves as very confident as well as very amiable pet reptiles, although they usually do not like to be removed unwillingly from their enclosures. I'm speaking very generally, obviously, but as we all know, all animals, especially snakes, are very individualistic. Now, when it comes to care for these guys, like I said, they are semi so you want to give them plenty of space as adults. They're very generalistic in the wild when it comes to eating, mostly. Some of the different ones seem to favor different ones, like the Darwin, the, uh, the, <laughs> apologies, the diamond pythons seem to have more mammalian based than some of like the coastals or the inlands that seem to vary in diet more with different species of mammals and birds. More bats, more parakeets, more cockatoos. The diamonds are a little bit more terrestrial mammals in general. These guys are honestly what I consider a really good choice, even more so than boa imperators or constrictors when moving to a larger, more intermediate level species of snake once you want to move on from like a lot of the very common uh, North American colubrids or even ball pythons. 
And that is because they are very hardy. These guys are, there's no such thing as a bulletproof animal, but these guys are pretty good. They put up with a lot of extremes and humidity and temperature variation, even throughout their natural range, regardless of their subspecies, as well as them being very generalistic and eventually being a very large python in the end, they actually do very well when it comes to husbandry and dialing in your husbandry practices when working with a new species of snake more so than a boa constrictor, which is more prone to overheating, a little bit more, they require much higher consistent humidity than these guys necessarily do. Parts of their, even parts of the coastal and the jungles, the humidity dips down into the low 20s during the arid hot summer parts. And as we said before with the diamond pythons, it even snows in parts of the range. So a very variable, very hardy, really cool species of snake. And these guys are honestly, and Morelia in general, are actually part of the reason why I got so in depth into the reptile community. Listening to NPR, Morelia Python Radio, and listening to these guys that were part of the Chondro and Morelia community was so fascinating and how passionate they were that sparked my passion and interest in it as well. And these guys are so popular that even people outside of what you would normally consider the reptile hobby are absolutely fascinated in love with these species of animals. For instance, a member of the metal band Slayer, Kerry King, actually has his own reptile breeding company called Psychotic Exotics, and he has been breeding these snakes for well over 10 years at this point, point. and he's branched out a little bit. He works with a couple different boas, and I think a few different um, colubrid species, but these guys are where his passion got started, and they are absolutely an amazing, amazing species of snake. Now, that being said, these guys, like I said before, can be a little bit nippy when it comes to babies. And so that's why these guys are not really considered a beginner species of snake. But I would argue these are some of the best species of snake to be kept in general in this hobby. You just have to remember that they will eventually require larger enclosures, a little bit patience, definitely understanding of snake body language and trust building with the individual animals, as well as because of these guys that in parts of their range, and during different times of year, they are eating either more frequent, smaller meals, or sometimes they only even eat, why are you going for my face so much, little one? I know, you're just having fun. Um, they are eating those very large wallabies and those large mammals, sometimes only eating once or twice a year. And so working outside of the norm that is essentially reptile hobby dogma of once every week, every seven days, that's when we feed a snake. Maybe doing something like seasonal feeding is a lot easier to figure out with a species of snake like a carpet python that does that naturally that you can better figure out how to acclimate their natural behaviors in the hobby for better science-backed, science-based, naturalistic behavior and naturalistic keeping. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Maybe one of these days I will actually go through and make an, a whole species spotlight for the individual subspecies themselves because even though they are very similar and they can be kept very similar, they all have very distinct individual things that make them so cool. Like, you know, the jungle carpet pythons that searching for this like highlighter yellow and ink black indigo black snake is so cool. And talking about some of the different morphs that come out of the different other species and the diamond pythons, which are just absolutely insane and really cool. And talking about the Darwin's pythons and then the potential of individual locality and maybe different differentiation between the mainland Darwins and the Papuan and or Darwin carpet pythons found in West Papua and New Guinea. Those type of things, they all deserve a whole lot being highlighted. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this really cool just kind of introduction to the species that is what we call carpet pythons and how variable and how beautiful these guys are. If you can, please like and subscribe. Check out my playlist of Species Spotlight where I have, I think, 50 different species highlighted at this point. You can go check that out. It helps with my click-through rate, so it helps YouTube kind of push my content and let other people know what else is going on. And let me know if you guys want to see any other species highlighted or a topic in the reptile community or anything else discussed and you want to hear from me. I do keep it down. I know it's taking me a while to get through them all, but I'm working on it. For instance, carpet pythons. I've been putting off for over a year and well over a dozen people were kept asking for a carpet python video. So here we go. So here is this beautiful, beautiful carpet python Hachi. And I'll probably throw up a little bit of B-roll of Juliet as well as my good friends, Brandon Exotics, who are the other carpet pythons you saw in this video. 
it was really fun talking to them and seeing their animals as well because while I don't keep a whole lot of Morelia, they absolutely were one of the jump starts into my passion of these animals. So, sorry for the little bit of rambling in. I just want to highlight how cool these are. Talking about my awesome friends, Braden Exotics. I think I called Brandon Exotics a second ago, but Braden Exotics. And so thankful of working with them. And hope everyone's having a great day. And we'll check you next time.